Uh, hi, my name is TJ Randall. I'm the Director of Sales Engineering for ZV Labs. So, uh, you guys having fun at the conference so far? Pretty good? Yeah. 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 CloudBees is doing a wonderful job, so keep it up. All right, so as people get settled in, um, what we're going to talk about today is building your continuous delivery toolkit. So, you know, we're at a Jenkins conference, so it's one of those things with continuous delivery. As we all know, continuous delivery isn't just about tools, but we happen to be at a tools conference, so it's okay. Uh, so the focus today, though, is the intention of the talk is to not only talk about what tools that you're using in your organization, but also to start to understand how do you talk to different parts of your organization through your toolkits, okay? And, what, and how are you getting those conversations started, all right? So, you know, the question, why are we having a discussion about other tools at a Jenkins conference? So obviously, I'm a vendor. And we're all here, does everyone here use Jenkins today? Yeah, we all use Jenkins, it's phenomenal, right? It is the product to use. So the question immediately comes up, what types of tools are we going to talk about today? Well, the first thing is, it's important to remember, it's okay to, to come to that point that maybe the tooling that I have, i.e. the Jenkins that I'm using with the plugins and the functionality, it might not be solving all my issues, right? That's kind of the first point that it's kind of okay to think about. Um, and of course, Jenkins can do so many great things. It's easy to expand your Jenkins functionality across various components, right? You're not just using it for continuous integration anymore. You know, you're using it for your unit testing. You're using it to scale within your environment. So there's a lot of functionality that you can do within that one tool. But what we tend to talk with people about is you start to hit boundaries, okay? You start to hit problem areas that maybe you start to realize this one particular tool isn't solving all those problems. So um, kind of a common thing that I tend to hear is you get, uh, you get the solution and it's running in prod and it's doing all your production deployments, but now you're having you know, challenges maintaining it, you know, keeping everything up to date. Or maybe you're actually hitting some other type of organizational process problem. So like you're, you seem to, uh, you know, you're not getting enough the proper reporting coming out of your deployments, things like that. So I think those are when you know, people start to realize, I have to start to think of this as a toolkit for continuous delivery. It's not just one tool that's going to solve all my problems and I can go home and you know, sit at the beach. So of course, we love Jenkins too. So at Xevia Labs, you know, one of the things that we thought about for a slide is to talk a little bit about what we're using the tool for. And I get to see a lot of customers and what are they doing. So, what was really hard is to try to find four of the plugins that we're using that we like to use. So who here uses, I would say, more than 10 to 15 plugins within their Jenkins installation? <coughs> Everyone's just using nothing. All right, so just a couple just to call out that we like. We love the, uh, the Build Failure Analyzer plugin. Uh, we find that cuts down a ton of time for our development teams on analyzing what's going on within your, your deployment. Uh, here, the Matrix Reloaded plugin, a guy on our team discovered this one, and it's phenomenal. It makes, you know, when you're doing these types of matrix builds, it makes it much more bearable when you have to, like, try to orchestrate this group. Um, the Promoted Builds plugin, uh, this is a great way to start to understand and distinguish between your good and your bad builds. Because, of course, you know, your dev teams are cranking more and more activity into your system. You have to really start to understand of all that activity, what is actually valid? What is good that I want to consume? And then throttling is always an uh, interesting conversation. So we internally in the lab, we like to use the uh, current, current builds plugin. So that's a pretty handy one we find. Uh, and then I started to think about it. I said, well, I get to see a lot of customers. And you know, there's a lot of people out there using Jenkins, which is obvious today. Uh, and a lot of these customers are using Jenkins in a lot of creative ways. So uh, one thing, if you're not using the build monitor plugin, this is obviously a great way to communicate to your other teams. Right? It's not just about a dev team that says, hey, my commit worked, and now we can deploy this application. You can start to publicize these results, and that other teams can share in that information. Uh, we're, another one that I actually came across yesterday that was pretty cool is the Swarm plugin. I've never used this one before, but if I understand it correctly, it, it enables uh, the slaves to auto-discover auto the Jenkins master. So the customer that I was at, this was a key part of their continuous delivery matrix. They were using this plugin for that. Uh, the shell plugin, anybody using that one? Anybody using that? That's like the delayed trash can, right? You don't want to throw anything away just yet, but uh, it's a great way to push that out of your view. And, and then the, uh, the time stamper. So that one, this is great. We actually started using this just recently. So 
you have all your jobs running and everything's you know working for you, but you have to start to understand some other concepts, such as you know what's running slowly, or are jobs you know being abandoned, is things stuck? So it's great time to start to understand those concepts. So when do people when do they start to think, okay, I have all this functionality, I built this out, now it's time to start to think about other tools. Well again, we kind of talked about a little bit about this. It's when you start to hit the edges of your CI tool. So concepts like security. So maybe you're having problems within your organization where you need to authenticate across your pipeline to production and you're running into difficulties there. Uh, reporting, that's always such a huge component to the release process, right? Different teams need to consume different pieces of information about what's going on in your application delivery. And so Jenkins, it has the luxury problem, right? It's based on success. They're, it's a phenomenal tool. People have expanded it technically in ways that no one could have imagined, right? Everything's possible. And then what tends to happen is you expand into an organizational problem. So you're solving a technical challenge, but you just hit something else and you say, whoa, what's going on here? So we like to actually kind of, we kind of think of that as like the onion of continuous delivery, right? The onion's bigger than just Jenkins. It's bigger than any one tool. And every layer of that onion represents some sort of pain within your organization, okay? Some of them are technical challenges, you know, like how do you solve things, building, code coverage, you know, your deployments. And some of them actually start to reach across teams and organizational barriers that you didn't anticipate. So you say, you know, do we have QA folks in the room today? Anybody from QA? Any, are there any DBAs? The DBAs are gonna have a hard time. Any DBAs today? Okay, we can make fun of them all in one time. But, so how is it that we talk about continuous delivery, we talk about DevOps, but then we have teams that run as individual silos? So if you've ever had that experience where you say, you automate uh, your deployments and development, everything's working well to integrate in testing, and then you try to move that into QA, and all of a sudden, a team says, we don't want that in our environment. It happens, right? So this is that onion, you know, peeling back and trying to understand that process. And really, at the end of the day, what the onion represents is a lot of times, the consumer audience of your information, they're not happy with what is being presented. So, you know, in, in Jenkins, the developers love it. They get exactly what they want because they get the information that they want it. But the teams upstream, as you're trying to get to production, it doesn't work for them. You know, they need something else, okay? So the real question is, have you ever really noticed that your continued, did people recognize that slide? I love this slide. I, I'll use this in every talk I ever give because you ever notice like our toolkit is exactly like this? You know, you say, okay, I want to do continuous delivery and what you end up getting, you know, what the guy who, you know, there's a really smart guy or gal in your organization and they came up with a new idea. By the time it got into production, you're like, wait a minute, that's not even what we wanted in the first place. So you kind of get this hodgepodge of tooling and silos of information and all these pieces that you're kind of starting to crazy glue together. And it works because, of course, you have to make it work. But it's not really what you wanted. So the first question to ask, how do you productionalize your toolkit? So if you think about how you started with Jenkins today, um, who here had an organ works in an organization where Jenkins was brought in by one or two technical people that either knew about it or you know, they kind of read up on it and they wanted to start to use Jenkins. Okay, cool. Now, and so the rest of the group, are you kind of, Jenkins is inflicted on you? Is that what happened? <laughs> <laughs> There's some unhappy people in the room, we gotta figure this out. Um, but that's important because what, that's great organic growth, by the way, right? Because someone is interested and they bring it in and hopefully it starts to expand in the organization. Because of course, a corporation is no different than in any soccer team, anything in the world. Once somebody starts achieving success, other teams naturally are gonna look and say, what tool is this guy using over here? You know, I'm, I'm you know, doing a deployment all weekend. And these guys, you know, they're done Friday night at 10 o'clock. So success will naturally attract people to be like, what's going on here? But how do you productionalize your tools? Like how do you talk to all the teams in your pipeline about the toolkit that they need, okay? And then another great question, who maintains it? So I, don't, I won't make you raise your hands on this one, but who here has a Jenkins installation that they don't know who maintains it? <laughs> or who maintains like the new plugin versions, right? You have all these great plugins, but who's maintaining the versions of those plugins and such? That's sometimes a hard question. But if I ask you to raise your hand, who has Jenkins and they're using it for production jobs? Does anybody there use Jenkins in production? How did, how did it get there? And who's managing it? 
So again, you probably know that, but it's an area where you're going to start to hit those boundaries that we talked about. Okay? And then what I tend to find, and so this is kind of a glossy statement, but it seems like most organizations, they try to limit or avoid this cross-team activity, this conversation when choosing a tool. And of course, why is that? You know, you bring in a tool, and you want to do a POC, and you want to evaluate that, and then of course you say, well, i got to evaluate another tool. You're taking people's time, you're taking people, you know, their energy and their focus away from their jobs, you're trying to do a good job. But to get, and you know, my group, you'll see it today, to get a dev person, a QA person, network services, a DBA, and an ops person in a room for three days, that's hard. But that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about how do they all get a voice at the table when you're choosing these tools. Okay. So this is what we're going to talk through a little bit for the time that we have, this conversation. So what we're going to do is I want to take a look at five technical needs that you have for your continuous delivery uh, goals that you have in your organization. Okay? So, you know, generally speaking, when we talk to people, they're, they're looking at such things as continuous integration, deployment, scaling, test, and release management. So some high-level groups around, you know, you, you recognize you need these things. Maybe you're on different tracks for you know, how well you're implementing these inside of your uh, organization. But these are kind of general, general ways to think about it. And then for this conversation, we're going to use five teams. So not every organization is structured the same way, but pretty much I think we can all relate to the fact that when you're developing an application, you're trying to get that in production, you normally have something like a dev team, a QA team, a database team, network services, and operations. So does that, hopefully that feels somewhat normal, you know, in what you're trying to deal with. So, let's talk a little bit about each of those areas and how that relates to the teams. So first off, so continuous integration. What's the reality that we tend to see around continuous integration? Well, you talk to a dev team, and they're super happy. They're like, I got a tool that allows me to build my applications, I do all my testing, I my code coverage, everything is just super, everything works fine. But in relation to those other teams, the QA team might say something like, you know, we don't need a CI tool. Just give us, you know, the application that you built. We don't want to be involved with that part of building the application. And so these other consumers of information, again, the DBAs, if there is a DBA, you raise your hand. I apologize. I'm not totally not. Here. But do you ever notice that's a hard conversation in some organizations to say, hey, why are you guys not automating your part of the application? Hopefully, you're 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 already knocking those barriers down. But for a lot of companies that I talk to, this tends to be a, a, a very distinct style. You know, so the DBA, we don't need to check our SQL, and it's not code. That's a great one. And then, so then the rest of the, you know, the rest of the consumers down the pipeline in production, they don't even know what a CI tool is. They're like, I don't know, James Jenkins. This is a true story. I actually just went to breakfast with my sister-in-law the other day. She works for a large organization here in Framingham, and I, we we're just conversationally talking about the project she's on, and I said, so what are they using? for continuous integration. You know, they have a huge continuous delivery initiative. My sister-in-law is a business analyst on this project, multi-billion dollar project. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how the code gets there. <laughs> so you're like, I mean, that's how they function and that's fine, but do you realize the depth of that problem? That you can see why the business is always mad. They never know when anything's coming. They don't know how it got there and they don't know what changed. But we as developers are like, I changed it. You can see it changed. So, for continuous integration, the reality of it, it's, it's very hard to answer those questions. What changed, why did it change, and how it changed? And each of those groups on our list, right, need to know that information in some way, okay? So, if you're thinking about your toolkit, you're thinking about continuous integration, obviously, for dev, you want to use, try to use the same CI tooling for all applications. So another common problem that I tend to see is you'll go to an organization and they use you know, a CI tool for one set of builds and then maybe some of it's manual and they don't want to put the time in because it's a legacy app, which is fine too. But, you know, even dev has this like hodgepodge of scripts and builds and tools and such. So for a dev development team, the challenge would be you want to use one set of tooling. You know, it doesn't have to be one standard. You have a couple standards. But have a set that is normalized that you can, you know, you can use across your team. And so the other piece of this is, do you ever notice this? How come commits don't document what actually happened? You ever notice that? You read like, okay, I made a change, and you're like, well, I reassigned a variable. You're like, that, you know, how does a business owner know what that means? So a normal task that a developer does, um, you, 
can change those things. Of course, that's hard to change. That's process, that's culture, that's, you know, that's not a rule, so to speak. So for QA, so QA needs to understand the changes as they relate to the request. So QA is always in the dubious position, right? They have the business on one side hammering them for when is it going to be done. You know, so they, they're viewed as a bottleneck. And then developments, like you're slowing me down, I can't push code in faster. So QA is in this position, you know, in a way, they're like, just give me the code, I don't care. But they also have the task of saying, I know this change relates to what the business just asked for. So how come your CI tool isn't helping them answer that question? Right, saves a lot of emails. Saves a lot of phone calls. Um, so for DBA and network services, I'm just going to say, you know, SQL scripts and scripts are code. Just check them in. Right? Version these things. Make it part of your build and deployment, you know, upstream deployment process. They should be there. Okay. Does anybody have that problem or is it just the companies that I tend to work at? Have you ever heard that in your organization? It's not code. That's a good one. Um, and then, so operations, of course, you know, from a continuous integration side of the house, they're not really consuming a lot of this information, generally speaking. But it is important for them to understand, you know, who here, you know, has, I actually talked to three people downstairs, they have an upcoming release it's tomorrow night, or I'm sorry, Friday night, right? So they've been trying to tell their operation team what's changing. You know, what do I got to look out for? Because operations has to keep everything up and running. Well, your CI tool can actually start to answer those questions too. And then, of course, the business. Just the visibility into the delivery of change. One funny thing about the siloing of information, I swear, I, you know, that's really what it is, is you're trying to keep the business out as long as you can because you're like, stop bothering me, I'm building, I'm trying, I'm hurrying, I'm going. But at the same time, it's kind of a funny catch-22. If you told them what was going on in a more consumable way, maybe that helps them build that confidence in the dev team to say, hey, okay, you guys are going to deliver. I know you're working on it. I know it's coming. Okay? So that's continuous integration. So deployment. What's the reality of deployment? So of course, dev, there's, this is the full spectrum. And this is obviously uh, one of the strong areas where you could be using Jenkins today, right? It's a great use for your Jenkins tooling. Um, and what that kind of generally tends to look like, you know, you're using tools, you have scripting, you have some magic sauce built in there. Um, who here has multiple people managing their Jenkins installation? itself, not the actual jobs inside of it, but managing the Jenkins installation. Okay, who here has one guy or gal that has to sit and they do that job? All right. cool. So one of the things that we find with dev teams, it's hard for them to communicate with their needs into, you know, because you have this one person that's really busy, it's hard for me as a developer to go, hey, you know what I need? You know, can you do this one thing for me? Well, you're just one more problem that gets put on the pile. So I think that's one of the challenges. And of course, you know, the QA side of it, I hate to put this up, but it's kind of true, is you get a really good deployment tool in development, and it's working, it's consistent, and then somebody says, you're not putting that in my environment, or I want to use my own tool, or name it. So then, you're not doing continuous delivery, obviously, at that point. You, you know, you have great CI, and then you have a wall. Because the minute you have to start doing it manually again, you're in reintroducing problems, okay? The DBAs, you know, the, you hear it all the time, you can't automate database deployments. You know, it's amazing that you still hear that in this day and age. Is it hard to do? Is it hard to do? That's kind of the question. The worst thing is the speakers ask the question in the silence. Watch the silence. <laughs> um, but you hear it, you hear database people, oh, that will do that, because they want that control. That's understandable, right? They're responsible for making sure that database is up and running. The application that's getting put inside of it, the application logic, a lot of times they're like, well, that's the dev team. Well, you can all automatically see the cycle that just got built. Okay? Uh, so your operations team, you know, can you imagine being an operator? Can you just imagine for a moment? Is anybody here in operations? I, I, I think about that. Those Saturday releases that take like six and a half hours. And you get a spreadsheet with seven tabs. It's like a miracle that application goes in. And not because of lack of skill on the operator's part. But can you imagine it's 2 in the morning and you're going through the spreadsheet and somebody's on the phone yelling? You're like, I, I don't know what tab I'm on. Right? But we expect our deployments to work that way. It's an interesting way to look at the world. Should application deployments be easy? Well, should is the key word there. But they are, they're hard and you have to think about it. So, for operations that's generally, you know, their source of frustration. And then of course the business, you know, they tend to be the, like the last person to be notified that it's time to go in because everyone's fighting the fires from the deployment changes that you just made. Then somebody says, oh shoot, we gotta call the business to let them in. So again, the, you know, it's that kind of conversation, that notification of what's going on. So, 
for deployment, what should our toolkit look like? What types of things are you looking for? Obviously, your, your dev people, they, and this is true across the board, of course, you want tooling that ensures consistent, fast deployments across all environments, right? No manual steps all the way to production. Is that hard to do? It sure is, but that's what you want. Uh, QA, so your deployments, this is a, another one. You know, sometimes when you're writing up your slide deck, you realize, man, this is an overstatement of the obvious. What does QA want? Well, the same deployment that just happened in dev. Why do we expect a QA person to actually do a deployment in the first place, right? You want to basically say, you know, they restrict their environment, they have control of it, no one gets in, but at the same time, I can deploy an application there with the proper permissions. Now they get that consistency and trust, so they start to trust the dev team more. So, network services. Uh, a lot of the organizations that, I tend, uh, that I've worked at, as well as work with now, uh, network services tends to control this deployment problem. You know, you think about what they have to deal with. They have their own deployments going on, and they have all these other people dropping things on top of them. So what they really need from your deployment tool, they need visibility. They need to see, they may not care that there's seven web applications going in this weekend, but they need to know that event is happening. They also need to start to understand what part of the systems are being touched, right? It's important. And of course, your business. You know, the last ones in the chain, of course, the visibility into current as well as upcoming deployments. So most of the time, it seems like this information is distributed via, you know, like the PM or like Excel spreadsheets, you know, you can expect your code on this date. Why not let some of the tooling answer them with some of those questions for you? Okay. So scale. So these, you know, represent again some some ideas around what I tend to hear around scale, right? Some versions of reality. So the dev team, again, they tend to be the leading edge here. They tend to be the ones that are bringing in the tools, the products, the ideas. Um, they're selling that, by the way, to the internal organization. So, you know, if you think about it, for the non-technical people in your organization, this idea of scale, the conversation has changed dramatically. Like, they know it's happening, you know, but to them, to hear the, the statement, uh, we're going to spin up 12 VMs tomorrow for a two-hour load test, to a non-technical person, they're like, what? How do you do this? You're like, how does that magic happen? So the dev team tends to be on the cutting edge of that, right? So they're bringing the products and the scripts and those types of things in. But do you notice what tends to happen when you're, when you're talking about scale? Everyone else tends to be a consumer down the chain. So development's really almost driving that process. And what tends to happen is teams like QA um, and you know the business, they're the, like the consumers of this thing happening. Like, here's your environment, go test it. Maybe that works okay in your organization. What is really nice, if you're talking about continuous delivery, if they can have the same access to environments for their own personal use, that's the idea behind it, right? So if a QA person says, hey, I need 10 VMs today to do load testing, I don't have to go through some 12-day process to run a ticket to get these VMs instantiated, where they know the development team can do that in an hour because they have the scripts to do it. So you know, sharing that information, sharing that technical ability, so the DBAs, of course, right? You can't scale the database. You can't instantiate database VMs. Like, that's crazy talk. Next thing you know, they're going to have remote controls for TVs, right? And then, then where are we going to be? My kids will have to get up and change the channel, for God's sake. Um, but network services, I think in this part of the conversation, they're the, kind of, they're the service organization. They tend to just be the, I got another ticket, I'm going to give you another environment. And they try to automate in their own way to try to alleviate that, that request that's coming in. Right, they're dealing with requests of all nature. Uh, so this is just one more set now that's been added to their stack to say, okay, at teams, they need you know, environments, they need you know, these crazy things. They need things spun up for two and a half hours and then they want to tear half of them down. And, you know, network service is almost like the kid in the middle. And of course the business, you know, the, at the end of the day, really what their question always is, is like, what do I got to point to to find this application that I'm testing? So, I don't know how you change that one, but that's okay, right? But the business is, as a, as a true consumer of this, a lot of times we get frustrated on the technical side. So we've solved the technical problem, but we haven't given them a good way to, to relate that information, to say, hey, guess what? Here's your environments that you're gonna use today. You know, yesterday you were using that environment, we tore that down, we did a snapshot build last night, this is where we're gonna put you today. So they understand it's okay that the environments underneath, they, they change. But it's, you know what I mean, they, they feel comfortable to say, okay, I got it. I understand the language that you're speaking, okay? 
So for scaling, of course, the dev team, their demands, it has to be, infrastructure has to be scaled as part of the CI process and your deployment process. That's what has to happen in your tool. You can't have, and, and, I, and unfortunately I do see that today, you'll have organizations where even the developers have to, have to you know, submit a ticket or make a phone call to get you know, environments scaled up. So it can't be like that. You, if you're really going to deliver applications faster, you have to be able to do that much more quickly than you know, in, your, in your development path as a tool. So of course, QA should get the same benefit. They're getting the same demands put on them from a technical perspective, so they should get the same benefit of the tools that are used in the dev environments. So for the DBAs, I like to say, you know, the pool's great, hop on in. So why not challenge them? And one of the things that you'll find, check the timer. Uh, one of the things that you'll find is the DBAs tend to be uh, much more tentative about joining that conversation because it's either new to them or maybe they don't want to. Maybe they're kind of happy they have an organization in place and they're, normal, they're used to that control aspect of their job. But what's important to help them understand is you're not taking work away from a, you know, a guy or gal at a desk, right? You're not putting someone out of a job. What you're actually doing is you're extending their, their role into the new parts of the organization. So there's a great line, I was at a customer visit a couple months ago, and uh, this should be like on a t-shirt. We're, we're in a, we, we did a one day workshop, and we got, an, we got an application deployed to two environments pretty quickly. And uh, the guy, the database guy in the room is like, well, what am I gonna do if we get this tool? And the manager is like the perfect punchline. He looked at him and he's like, the job I hired you to do, right? Because unfortunately, don't you find that? I mean, that's true across a lot of these teams. People start to do a lot of this work because there's no one else to do it and it needs to be done. Why not let the tooling do some of that work for you? So who here actually is doing scaling for the, on the database side of their application deployments? I'm just curious. Tentative hands? Are you trying it out? Like, is it something that you're trying to get into the pool too? Lots of silence. Scary stuff. Okay, operations and network services, the biggest thing there, as you talk about your toolkit, is they need visibility. So maybe they don't, you know, they don't need to know the day-to-day -day stuff, what you're doing, and honestly, they, they shouldn't have to care, right? So they are gonna set up their organization in such a way that they can easily service the teams that are making the request, and at the same time, that's your environment. You do what you want to. That's okay too, right? The, you know, the, the dev teams, the QA teams are getting what they want out of that. And of course, the business, you know, clear information about the infrastructure. One thing that I'll find often is the fact that, as I said that, alluded to it earlier, is the business doesn't trust the new environment. So you, you know, you're able to scale quickly, and you have these new environments, and you say, you know, you say to the business, look, it, we're going to deliver our application faster, and the way that we're going to do that, we're going to spin up these environments nightly on a nightly uh, build deployment. So we'll give you the latest and greatest. You can go in, you can start to build your training materials, all those good things. And the business at first is like, well, wait a minute, how come it's different? Is it different? You know, like, what, what, why am I going to another place? Because they're still in the world. They're still thinking there's a server in, you know, the data center in the back that they're logging into. They don't understand necessarily, conceptually, what's happening. Okay? So it's, a, it's more of a trust conversation than anything else. Okay. The dreaded word, testing. So, isn't really that, I mean... When we talk about it, testing, testing, testing means deployment, deployment, deployment. So what is testing in reality? What do we generally find? Well, the CI tools, of course, Jenkins is phenomenal in this area, right? And it helps teams not only build better code, and it also helps them test that code, faster, you know, faster feedback, understanding what's going on. So, you know, the dev team, I think sometimes this is actually a, a bit of a challenge for them too is you actually have the tooling in place, you know, if you're using Jenkins, they actually may be a little slow to go to the testing model. You know, for some developing teams, they're like, well, it'll get tested and integrated, or it'll get tested downstream in QA. I ran my tests, um, and we'll let somebody else do the, the full spectrum of testing. No, that's, you know, it doesn't work, right? It, it might work for small changes, but of course, one small change affects the entire landscape of an application. So. For the dev teams, it's a bit of a narrow look at the world. So for QA, again, another generalization, but what I generally find, they want to use their own tools. So they say, you can use whatever you want on your side, but I'm going to use my set of tools to re, you know, do my reporting and do the functional testing that I need to do. Um, and so 
Is that true? Do you guys find that's true? That your your QA organization uses their own testing tools? No one here. Everyone's not in the head. Okay, cool. Again, I think that's that's a harder problem to solve. If QA wants to use their own tools, maybe one of the things they need to do is be the champions of their toolkit to say, guys, everyone can use this toolkit because this is the power of that toolkit. This is why. You know, who it, I think we all know that. Continuous delivery, especially when it first gets introduced into an organization, somebody has to be the champion of that. Somebody has to speak out and say, look, at this is what we're going to do. Tools are no different, right? Somebody's got to drive the adoption of that tool. Why can't maybe QA drive that? Unfortunately, what you tend to get is that silo effect, right? So it's that really interesting concept where I, as a developer, work really hard to test all the things that I know about, and then it goes over a wall, and it starts getting tested against things I didn't realize, you know, it wasn't part of my test suite, which is then kind of comical. I could have tested some of those things before I gave it to you, right? Talk about speeding up application delivery. Um, the database, I've actually heard that on a call at 2 in the morning, where the the DBA said, yeah, we tested it, the database is up. No, no. We have a little problem. <laughs> the application is not, but that's okay. Um, so testing isn't usually part of that conversation, which is its own kind of craziness. And by the way, that's another hard area, right? How do you automate database testing? Um, and there's, there's tools for that also. There's lots of great solutions out there. But it has to become part of your toolkit and not separate pieces, right? So network services. If you, I mean, this group, this team that I keep uh, generalizing about, most of the times they have their own tools that focus on their areas of concern. So, you know, they don't care about your application per se, but they want to know what happens when you drop your application into their QA environment. You know, what just happened to, you know, what happened inside of the environment. That's what their test kit is looking at. And of course, the business, you know, I think sometimes the business brings this one on themselves. A lot of times they say, we're going to use our own testing. We got an Excel spreadsheet, and I got 14 people, and they're all going to do their testing, which might work in your organization. But, I mean, just philosophically, why don't we want to take some of that knowledge that, and that testing and that process, bring that in earlier in the pipeline? Like, who wants to be testing at 2 in the morning on a Saturday night? I don't know. I, I, I generally don't. So there's other things to do, right? So for our testing tools, in our, you know, it's part of our toolkit. So. You basically want to make sure, you know, your dev team, their testing tools are giving quick results. So again, this is this is pretty much true, I think, right now. If you're in, implementing testing as part of your continuous delivery initiative, especially as part of your Jenkins initiative, um, you're getting that quick feedback. You're understanding what's happening to your build. You're testing your application. You're making sure that, you know, you're building a reliable product. And then the other piece of this, these tests should be shared up. Okay, so that's cool, the development team has their tests. Why are these not going forward? So just like QA should be sharing it back, you know, why are you not testing those, sharing those tests forward? And I think it's another important conversation for the business. How come you're not letting the business know the testing that you're doing? So imagine that conversation where you had a really bad deployment and you know, you're talking to the business in a post-mortem. Do people here do post-mortem? Um, but you're talking about it, you say, what went wrong, how do we do this better? And you're able to say as a developer for the next release, you know, that next release into production, you're able to say, hey, you know what, I took your ideas and I actually implemented those tests. So now I know that, you know, at least we're covering this area, this problem area. That's a cool conversation. Because you know what the business feels like? You're listening. The business, all of a sudden, you just build trust with the business uh, to say, hey, they get it. You know, we're not just building an application, we're trying to get this you know, better, we're trying to make things, you know, more, more um, proficient. So tooling uh, for QA, you always want to make sure that it's okay to use your own tools. What you really are looking for, and I think testing is a great example, you want tools that play nicely with each other. So you want, you're looking for something in your toolkit that allows teams to use what they need to do, but you want to make the information that comes out of it consumable for other people. So I like to use the example, QA should be sharing their tests down, dev sharing their tests up, so now they're both learning, they're getting better as, a, you know, as an organization. And, by the way, you can share that information up as you move forward. Network services, so they're not going to change their toolkit. They're not going to move towards a more like application-centric testing model. That's not what they're being charged to do. But what we can help them to do is, how do we talk about 
what we, you know, it's kind of like that same conversation. We listened to you, you know, we've inflicted these problems in the past with our application deployments. We've included some of that testing down in the, the quote for the lower levels, you know, the devs, the, the QAs, etc. You know, your network services team, that's a good conversation for them too. And by the way, you can invite them into those environments as well. Obviously, sometimes that gets challenging with modeling the test, you know, you don't get the same load, etc. But if you're having that conversation earlier in your deployment process, the network services team, they know what's coming. They know what to look out for. They, you know, maybe they, they recognize that they need to implement new testing because of this new functionality that you're delivering. Okay. And then the business, of course, is the feedback into the groups about testing requirements. So, um, if you work in an organization, you know, these larger organizations where, you know, like your business requirements are like 700 pages, like this is the app that I want, you know, the next six weeks. Um, testing generally gets put on like a back burner because, you know, then, and I, again, I'm generalizing for the organization, but the focus then is, okay, how do I get these requirements to the developers? How do we get the, you know, the team spun up? They're all writing code. They're trying to deliver code on time. And then the testing conversation comes in last. So that Excel spreadsheet that I talked about for the business, that way to test this, this entity, of course it's going to be last. Of course it's not going to have you know, tooling and automation. It's going to be the afterthought. It's going to be the part that, unfortunately, you know, comes in at the, you know, at the end of the application delivery process. Okay, so the last part of your you know, continuous delivery, you know, your goals is release management. So of course, what do we call that? We call it Excel or Power. So um, your dev teams today, they're probably using some uh, different types of tooling for this, you know, Jira as an example. Uh, the conversation about release management, a lot of times that happens across like emails, you know, scrums, uh, all different forms. But a lot of times I find organizations are keeping track of that information. You know, so you got emails going out, hey, I'm two days late, I'm gonna get this to you, you know, next Thursday, that's cool, but you know, now, how do I relate that out to the rest of the team? So there's this buzz of activity, but not a lot of information coming out of that, consumable information. So for release management, of course, QA, we'll talk about the person in the middle again. So they have sources of information coming at them from two different sides, the development side and the operation side, the business side. And they have to aggregate that in some sort of form that says, okay, I know next Tuesday I'm gonna take the next release and here's the features that's coming. And also I have four more releases behind that. And how do those application releases relate to each other? Can I actually take those into my environment? They have that, you know, they're trying to process this information of, you know, you have multiple streams coming at you, how do I make that all work within one environment? And of course, some companies solve that by doing one at a time. You know, they, it's the whole railroad problem, they have 17 tracks and it's all gotta go to one. That's painful. And so, of course, for release management, where the DBAs come in, they're just like, just call us, just tell us when you want the SQL run. Or one of the new ones I'm starting to see a lot more often is, we'll check your SQL, but you can run it. So, that's always an interesting one for release management. Um, so for your network services team, they've got their own releases to maintain. And it doesn't have anything to do with your applications, you know, the development team's applications. They're trying to keep systems up and running. So for them, release management for an application is, I shouldn't say it's noise, but it's not necessarily on the top tier of what they're caring about because they have a lot of things that they're trying to juggle at the same time. So that's not meant as an excuse, it just meant more of a reality. What are they trying to deal with as a team? And then of course operations, you know, a lot of times this whole release management, one of the, the ways that this happens is you'll have like a release management meeting, you know, you have those Wednesday meetings where everyone shows up with their spreadsheets and they all know when things are coming in. And so now operations, they just got 17 spreadsheets with six tabs each, you know, that now they're like, oh, now I know it's coming. But again, it's cute, and I'm obviously making fun of it a bit, but they're dealing with that same problem. Emails, you know, spreadsheets, everything, all these different sources of information that they're forced to aggregate. That's the real challenge here, right? It's not that the information isn't good. How do I piece it together to understand it? And then the business, of course, what are they streaming for? They're like, when are my features coming? So today, usually the project manager's, you know, getting that hit all the time. When is it coming, when is it coming? Well, there's other things in play. So the, you know, the PM can see, I'm dealing with my development team and I can see this and I can see this, but there's a larger system in play that's happening to get that application into production. And it's not just technical. So 
it's pretty obvious why the business is always confused when they're going to get their features. You know, they, they said, build this, and then they're kind of having conversations, and then kind of magically it comes out on a Saturday night. Um, so again, it's sources of information that people are trying to aggregate. So for your toolkit, I think it's important just to remember you have other tools now that are in place. So we've been talking about Jenkins, for example. Jenkins provides a significant amount of great information about what you're doing on the development side. That needs to be communicated as part of the release management process. You know, like the build promotion plugin. Why is that guy not saying, hey, I've got a great build, I'm promoting that to QA. So then QA is notified, they say, okay, I got a good build coming. So right there you have like a, a great way to communicate information. So QA was expecting it, now they know what's happening, okay? So your, um, so of course your QA team, the release management drives the dates, so QA is part of an overall release, so they don't look like the bottleneck. QA, you know, is a very valid stopping point along the way, but they're not bottlenecking you on purpose. They're actually trying to help you get that application through, and you're giving them good information to do that. So the DBAs, another one, again, there's gonna be a DBA after this, it's gonna hit me a rock or something. But they have to actively participate. You need to demand that all teams that are involved with an application deployment participate in the release management. You can't be the kid on the sideline saying, yeah, just call me, you know, I'll show up. If you, you know, and obviously they don't have to be in the scrum every morning, right? There's a, you know, there's a, there's a team communication that has to happen, but they have to be part of the release management process. So yes, maybe it is, you get to a certain point of release, you pick up the phone and you call them, but they also have to feed back information about what they're doing and what's happening in there. Um, operations, of course, they need easy access. So when you're thinking about your toolkit, instead of that release management meeting where they're trying to aggregate all of the things, all the moving parts, um, they can see this in one, you know, like the whole thing, the whole idea of, I can look at it from 40,000 feet, and I can start to drill down into it to understand what's going on. Okay. So then uh, the business, so the ability to access and participate. They're another one. They should be participating in this release process and not just from the screaming and yelling, where is my application, right? They're part of this. A common uh, thing that I see is where the business is asked to come in and uh, they have to create like training documentation for an application release, okay? So the com a company will try to balance that by saying, okay, we're not gonna let you into dev because you know we're still baking. Uh, we'll let you in at QA, but of course QA doesn't necessarily want to let them in because QA knows there might be some bug fixes coming behind it, okay? So this in invitation to participate tends to get uncomfortable fast because what are you doing? You're saying to the business, I know you asked for this and I promise I'm going to deliver it next Thursday, but when you see it on Monday, it might not be done. Well, of course, what business user is going to be like, you're full of it or, you know, I don't want to see it until it's done. You're like, well, it's a catch-22. So that's part of that conversation in an organization that's built on trust. The more, the better you're able to do that, you know, deliver on Thursday, the more they're gonna be comfortable with the fact that on Monday, all right, it doesn't look exactly right. You know, I asked to flash blue on Thursday, it's Monday and it's still flashing blue, I don't know why, that's okay, we're gonna fix it. So, but again, it's building that trust relationship and that's part of release management too. They know you're gonna deliver, so guess what, the hammer gets a little less heavy. Okay, so just a few minutes left. Obviously, I've mentioned, you know, I'm not so clever, but did I mention that I'm a vendor? So, obviously, I'd love to talk to you about what you're actually doing. So, I encourage you to please come down to the table downstairs. You can have a fortune cookie, which is always fun. But um, these are real problems that we're dealing with, and they're actually a lot of fun in an organization to talk and see what your challenges you're, you're uh, trying to work through. So, and then I want to thank all the sponsors. So there's a lot of great people downstairs. Thanks to CloudBees for putting on such a phenomenal uh, conference. And uh, that's it. Any questions? Anything?